so of course we're here in Antarctica. It's the big white band here, but it's always misleading to see this big land like this on these kind of maps. Um, and when you look at Antarctica from the South Pole, so you look up here, um, there's it's fairly large. It's about 5,000 kilometers across. So there are large distances here that are considered. And it is surrounded by a current that goes around like this and keeps going around and essentially um, isolates the, the continent and the ocean. Now we're talking about the Antarctic Ocean. Now they, they, they are, there's a new province for that um, from others that are further up north and are a lot warmer. So here the color codes the temperatures you will get in the water. And essentially what is pink here is close to freezing for seawater. Um, okay, um, the, so historically, Antarctica has not always been there. It's, as you know, there's plate tectonics and the, the continent drifted south. Eventually, an uh, opening appeared here, the Great Passage, and that's what happened. That's what allowed the circumpolar current to isolate this continent. As a result of this, of the cold temperatures and isolation from the other oceans, you have a lot of endemic species. So people who have been diving in Antarctica say, well, it was fairly poor. True, there are some very unusual species. So that's one of the reasons I went, I went there. Um, the diversity is pretty low, but some of the animals are just amazing. And we're going to go over this a little later. Mm -hmm. So as you all know, we're experiencing global warming. And as the name indicates, the whole globe is concerned, um, but it's actually more pronounced over uh, at the poles. So of course in the Arctic with this very uh, charismatic pictures every time, but also in Antarctica. As Nuno mentioned earlier, species distribution have been shifting, shifting sorry, towards the poles, but here in Antarctica, well, there's a continent, so they cannot go further south to try to get colder temperatures. This will not happen. So that's one of the reasons why we went down there to study how the animals were coping with temperature increase, how they were going to cope in the long term with temperature increase. When you look at Antarctica, the warming is not homogeneous either. So the peninsula is mostly concerned here, and you have the Ross Sea right here, where you always see these big, big icebergs just breaking off the shelf all the time. And uh, they are about the size of New York City sometimes. They just, just go there. And um, everything you see on TV happens right here. Where I worked was here, and it's right now not warmed up by much. So when we go there, there is a fair fairly large footprint in CO2, of course. Um, we uh, take planes for, oh, I didn't push this, sorry. Planes for two days, we arrive in Tasmania. From Tasmania, we have to cross through the 40s, the 50s and the 60s, not a pleasant trip, um, to arrive in Antarctica in uh, Dumont d'Urville station. Um, so that's a five or six day, trip with the boat. So overall, say about a week to go there, a week to come back, a week to come back, of course. And we stay there for about four to six weeks. So we're there, these huge icebergs everywhere. And then you get close to the uh, French station. Uh, only scientists go there. There is no tourism allowed there. Once in a while, we have a Russian ship that comes in um has uh, people coming and just checking out the, the base but that's it um so this is the uh astrolab it's a french ship that uh mostly carries passengers of course scientific passengers and the people who actually operate the whole station and fuel i remind you that we are about 2500 kilometers away from the closest power station, let's put it this way. So we have to produce our power here, uh, fresh water here and everything. So Antarctica is a little bit of a challenge to work there. Um, this is the French station. 
that it's just a group of buildings right here. And there are a few more here for summer operations. And this little orange dot here is the uh, diving station for us. So, of course, we have, oh, we're French, so we have a cook and a baker, pastry chef, um, and they will operate in this building. This is just sleeping quarters over here, and there's a hospital. Hospital is a small hospital. We have one doctor. That's it. Um, the power station I mentioned earlier is here. It's very important. If that breaks down, there's some big problems ahead. Okay, so that means that the distance to the nearest high pressure chamber is Tasmania, 2,500 kilometers. Um, that takes, like I said, five days if the boat is there. Um, not very practical. Um, the nearest dive shop is also in Tasmania, of course. So when you go there, you have to plan to have plenty of spare parts. And all your equipment needs to be checked and double checked before the season. You pack everything into boxes and this will travel with the ship. As a consequence, we have a maximum depth allowed that is 20 meters with no deco. So for scientific divers, it's fairly unusual. Let's put it this way. But again, no high pressure chamber. So if anything happens, we'd rather have something small that happens. Um, of course, we need to have special equipment um, because of the temperature of the water. It's when we go there, it's minus 1.8 degrees Celsius. Um, in summer, it can go up to zero. Uh, so it's always cold and fairly unpleasant. So you have to be nicely equipped. Um, dry suit and undersuit, I'll go over this uh, again later. And the regulators, special regulators with heat exchangers to uh, make sure they don't freeze over. And there's some I put potentially dangerous wildlife because there's very little knowledge about these animals and how dangerous they can be for us as divers. Um, there was one incident with an orca. I think it was at McMurdo. A young lady drowned. It was just taken to the bottom by the orca and a lady drowned there and uh, sea leopards. So we have to use adapted vehicles. Um, so sometimes we have to make a fair distance to uh, to the dive site. So we either dive in open water, as you see in the background, or sometimes through holes in the ice. Hmm. Ah, there you go. Um, the compressor is an electrical compressor. It's always hard to deal with gasoline locally. So it's uh, a lot easier this way. Uh, the air is very clean in Antarctica, which is a good scene. Uh, okay, so we uh, made a compromise with a dive suit uh, that is neoprene, but very, very tough outside because the ice is a lot more um, rigorous than you would think. Uh, it can be pretty hard. There are some sharp edges and you can just puncture your dry suit pretty easily. So we decided to go with this for now. It was also a lot more affordable than the trilaminate we looked at as an alternative. And under that, we have a somewhat of a jumpsuit and it's just fleece about 10 millimeters thick to try to insulate us from the, from the cold water. Um, so very cumbersome. Often we need help to uh, put our equipment on. But then once you're in the water, it's well worth it. Not very elegant, of course, there. Um, after the dive, we often have frozen first stage and second stage, stage on the regulators. I had one freezing once. Um, so I know what it feels like, but then it's well worth it. So um, we, as soon as you dive, the penguins are extremely curious and will come and check you out. The first um, five or six meters are scoured by ice every year. So basically very smooth surfaces, only um, some surfaces are vertical and will allow here calcareous seaweed to grow. A few examples of this. So here you have the island on this side. So the where the ice meets the, the rock, 
is uh, pretty stable, but then once you get a little further away, the ice can be a little dangerous. So this is really where you'll find all the penguins. They're most of the time seeking small rocks to build their nests with. Then you start seeing some of the large seaweeds um, and there are, they take a few years to reach these sizes. So obviously here the scouring is less common and you start finding animals that are associated with the whole fast of these seaweeds. And uh, you, we worked on these guys a lot. But then when you find sheltered places, you'll see some, things that look very familiar and others that do not. So of course, alcyonids, sea urchins, um, some, go uh, sorry, uh, Holothurians for you. <laughs> um, anemones, uh, some worms, and we're gonna go over a bunch of pictures with these. Sponges, uh, alcyonid again, so soft crawl, Holothurians. So as you can see, it's pretty colorful. You see here a beast that is pretty large. We'll have a lot of pictures of these. These are pycnogonids. They are the closest relatives to uh, spiders in the water. But most of the time when we dive, they are about one or two centimeters across. In Antarctica, they get a lot bigger. So we also have a few cliffs. As you see, the water is pretty clear, although it was fairly late in the season. The good season for plankton there is very short. So we went from fairly clear water to something akin to uh, soup rather than water uh, over two weeks. So if you get, you've got plenty of sponges uh, with different shapes and colors. Uh, I, there's a fairly large diversity of sponges down there. And you, as you can see, well, these are not the colleagues of pictures that our colleagues showed us earlier, but uh, the the colors and the, the contrast is very often very nice and will let you take good pictures even if you're not a good photographer. Um, okay, still in the sponges. Some of the walls on the cliffs are just covered of these sponges. This is the time of the year that they will have plenty of plankton, so plenty of food and they will accumulate a lot of energy to uh, spend the, the winter and wait for the next good season. So Cnidarians, there are some jellyfish, of course. There's one. Um, beautiful, and we'll see these guys again later. These are little amphipods, and they're babies of this animal here. It's always associated with this jellyfish. The good thing about Antarctica is everything moves slowly. So you can get close to your subject and actually take pictures. Anemones can get quite large as well. This is the one species of Gorgonian there is in Antarctica. Alcyonids, again, only one species. There's a sea urchin here in the corner. Um, in the mollusks, there are a few bivalves. This is... Uh, this is, um, ah, I left the name in French, sorry. <laughs> um, damn it, the word escapes me right now. Um, scallops, thank you. Uh, so these are fairly fast growers. Um, they get that big in about two or three years, whereas when you um, look at other animals, they have very slow growth rates. So the urchins you saw earlier, for instance, we suspect they are between 30 and 40 years old to get this size. So a few sea slugs, less colorful probably than the ones you get in the tropics or in uh, even in our waters. This is a snail, it's called Marsignopsis, and essentially the whole foot of the snail covers the shell. When you open the, the foot, the shell is very flimsy inside. Um, this is a Nemertians. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Nemertians in, uh, in the ocean. Uh, these about, are about 1.5 meter long, uh, whereas the ones we get under our latitudes are a lot smaller than that. Well, they can be pretty long, but then they're very skinny. Uh, here, they probably found something to feed on or they're breeding, we're not sure yet. 
So I work a lot on polychaetes, annelids. So we heard about the fireworms uh, yesterday and uh, the big triton shell. <laughs> Uh, so this is my specialty, working on worms, uh, feather dusters, so other worms, these just fil uh, filter the food in the water, and there are a bunch of them in some areas. Um, these are the ones I work on. Uh, I will mention an environment in a few minutes. Uh, so these are scale worms. This is my taxonomic specialty. Um, these are not very large, but these are actually new species we found in ice caves. Um, there are some giant species there as well. So this one, this is my hand, by the way, there. Uh, they can be, be up to 30 centimeters, whereas the, uh, the ones we get under our latitudes are maximum five centimeters. So there are quite a few giants in Antarctica. Bryozoans. Uh, echinoderms. It wouldn't lose the shape, no worries, but uh, I mean, the colors are pretty amazing and somewhat unusual for most of the divers. Uh, again, the sea urchin, one species known there, uh, slow growing, they're holotherians, sea cucumbers. Uh, Ophiorids, small diversity of them, not a whole, whole lot. And crinoids, uh, so these, um, the, uh, we call them sea dancers sometimes in the Mediterranean. You see them just moving their arms very fast and swimming in the water. Uh, these guys are about that big across. So when it's, it's quite a sight when you see them taking off and going away. Crustaceans, very uh, surprising. Only one species of shrimp around the whole continent. No crabs. You will not find a crab in Antarctica. Only deep sea species, some of them start to come up a little bit, but otherwise, shallow water Antarctica, there are no crabs. So the amphibod we saw earlier with the two babies in the uh, in the jellyfish as well. Isopods, so essentially roly polies. Some of them are quite large. So the one you have up there. It's about that long. And again, everything moves slowly. So when you see something and you want to collect it, to record it, just grab it and put it in the bag. So these are the pycnogonids. So they look like spiders. Again, they're their closest relatives. They feed on cnidarians. So this one is just gobbling an anemone here. And um, so they can be about dinner plate across. Well, the species we have here are about one to two centimeters across. This one is feeding on the uh, cyanide again. Sometimes you have leeches attached to them. So they're so large that parasites can actually feed on them. Ascidians, quite large as well. So gigantism is quite common in Antarctica. Um, there are a bunch of species of fish. Some of them have very weird adaptations. So as I told you, the temperature of the water is minus 1.8 degrees Celsius, which is fine for seawater, remains liquid, but the fish have less salts in their blood. So they, at this temperature, they should be frozen. So they have antifreeze proteins that they produce in their blood to avoid freezing over. And there are a few pictures here, we found ice caves and it is in these environments that we found the new species I mentioned earlier. So essentially you have ice tubes through which you can go and uh, it sort of is, it mimics a little bit the deep sea in that there's very little food coming inside. And these ice tubes um, contain few species, but some of them are specific of this environment. So if we had not gone into these ice tubes, we will not have found some of the new species we described. At the end of the dive, uh, we come out of the water with a lot of help. Uh, by the way, this is the physician who was on the base on the station for us. So someone had to make sure we were okay coming out of the water. That was him. And I thank you for your attention. And if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy.